going to do is share with you uh, something that I've been working on for the last five years, um, which is a, a book that I'm hoping to finish one day if um, um, I get the opportunity about the evolution, the rise of Israel's special operations forces from 1936 till today. And since I'm a political scientist, I started with a very ambitious goal. I wanted to study the rise of special operations forces in general. And I uh, had an opportunity to run this idea by several colleagues at the University of Chicago. Um, because this is clearly, when we, we listen to the news today, we hear a lot about special forces, special operations forces, uh, deployment of few teams to different parts of the world. And and from empirical data, this is clearly the most, uh, the fastest growing branch in most militaries around the world, uh, let alone police forces and security agencies. So I was interested, first of all, to, to identify what are special operations forces and why do they proliferate all of a sudden or over the last uh, 30 years. And my good colleagues at the University of Chicago told me, listen, you are a little bit too ambitious. Why don't you, you know, take a step back and focus on an arena that you really understand. And for me, and here I have to um, acknowledge our defeat as political scientists or uh, historian colleagues, um, the place that I know best is Israel. Hebrew is my mother tongue. I have no problem um, accessing documents or interviewing people and understanding the nuances um, of the Hebrew language and the Israeli culture. And part of the research in security studies is a little bit flat in this regard. We political scientists tend to, if we have numbers, we don't need to review documents documents and we what I learned from this project is that we miss large parts of the picture. So I, I became increasingly uh, respectful of um, our friends in the in history departments and other departments that really take years and um, understand context, languages, culture, etc. What I'm going to discuss today um, is going to be extremely not contentious. Uh, it's going to be the issue of um, the emergence of Israel's special operations forces in the pre-state era. And I'm going to argue that not only that Britain, the first country that introduced special operations forces, or as Winston Churchill called them, commando units, two days after the uh, conclusion of the uh, Operation Dynamo, the evacuation from Dunkirk, not only that Israel was inspired by the British Army, but actually inspired the British Army, and I'll try to uh, explain how. And I'm not going to waste time um, in an attempt to show you um, why it is so problematic to identify and define what special operations forces are. I can tell you one thing. Up until the Second Boer War, meaning 1899, it was the least desirable military profession. Actually, most militaries denounced the use of special forces or commandos or relegated them. They used to hire mercenaries that would carry out such operations because they were considered dishonorable and were associated with bandits or terrorists because basically the tactics of small warfare are very similar. So people didn't want to do it. They wanted to die as heroes riding their horses in the battlefield. They didn't want to you know, outflank the enemy and attack from the rear. So it was very honorable, but very ineffective in military perspectives. What led to the change was the Industrial Revolution. And if we take a look at the Second Boer War in uh, South Africa, we see the might of the British Army um, versus several militias. The word commando, by the way, comes from Afrikaans. These are the militias that operated, that were supported and operated uh, in, the, um, in Eastern South Africa um, and included um, mostly uh, farmers who did not have military forces to defend them. Uh, they were very good snipers, um, horse riders, they knew the terrain perfectly and they took advantage of it. And Churchill happened to be there, happened to be captured by them, and he was a very 
um, devout student of military affairs. He took notes of everything, he published a book on everything, but he was very much uh, um, aware of uh, what they were doing. And during the very last stage of the war, um, Britain accepted the offer from a Scottish lord from the Highlands who said, why don't we send some of our Highlanders to South Africa? We know how to fight such wars. And this was the first time <coughs> sorry, in military history, that camouflage uniform were introduced to the battlefield because these Scotsmen, who are extremely um, um, well-versed hunters and, uh, and people who knew uh, how to work in rough terrains, used these as a way to disguise and attack the enemy. Today, and again, I'm trying to be very... Um, brief about the definition, what we need to remember is that it's very hard to define special operations forces or special forces in each country that are defined differently. Basically, we can aggregate or argue two main things. First, these are units that are being formed quickly as a response to a challenge or an opportunity that the army or the armed forces do not have an answer to. And they serve to bridge a gap between the potential power of the military and the actual effectiveness of the military in the battlefield. And I can give you examples later if you are interested in the broader question. Second, these units have to be specialized in different areas of warfare in order to execute um, their missions. And this, at, at this point, it's enough because what I want to uh, emphasize is how they came to be and what basically inspired uh, the British Army um, to form them. And interestingly, the people who formed the Special Operations Forces in Britain, the commando units, and I'm talking about um, close to 40 units that evolved and changed during the war, and this is only the uh, British military, I'm not talking about the SOE, the MI9 uh, uh, Special Operations Service that, was, uh, that evolved during the war, are probably not very famous. One of them, his name is Dudley Clark. The other was the British Chief of Staff, um, um, uh, General Dill, uh, who Dudley Clark uh, and him were very uh, close buddies. Now, there is something fascinating that um, very quickly I realized about Special Operations Forces. When I read the biography of Dudley Clark, then Old Wingate, then David Sterling, the founder of the British SAS, then the biographies of various um, commandos in Israel, these are very unique characters. It's not easy to come up with the ideas that they come up with. And all of them, especially those in Britain in the first part of the 20th century, were committed to the military as much as they were committed to art and theater and writing. So these are extremely creative individuals who are not professional soldiers. For many years, special operations officers never made it to the top of their militaries. They were free spirits. And this creativity allowed them to become so effective in what they did. Now, when we look at the uh, case of Palestine, then the state of Israel, there was one person like that who arrived in um, Palestine after his mentor, Joseph Trumpeldor was killed in Tel Chai. His name was Itzhak Lendoberg or Itzhak Sadeh. Again, not a person that is very well known in Israeli history and I would argue that the majority of high school students never heard of him except for a street or a corner, you know, somewhere, a junction that is named after him. This man was born in um, to a Hasidic family in Lublin. He was a, a, a grandson of the rabbi of the Jewish community. His personal instructor, he had a private tutor since he was a child, was Hillel Zeitlin, a great Jewish scholar. And his cousin is a very well-known philosopher named Isaiah Berlin. So a very unique background, but Itzhak Sadeh was not 
a typical scholar, Jewish scholar. He was slightly, you know, he, he was a fragile boy and his health was always frail, so his parents sent him to the gym. And I'm talking about the late 18, uh, 19th century. The guy became a bodybuilder. Then he became completely dedicated to boxing and wrestling. And he was um, um, consumed by the idea of becoming an artist. He loved to draw and he loved to write. At the same time, he was very political. He saw himself as a Russian patriot and then a Zionist. And I'm not going to tell you his whole biography, but he arrived in Palestine in 19... Um, 20 after the death of his mentor. And at that point in time, 1920 is a pivotal moment because this is the first time that the Jewish leadership, the central leadership in Palestine introduced a military force called the Haganah. What does Haganah mean in Hebrew? Defense. Very simple. The, the name defense encapsulates everything that this organization was supposed to stand for. They were protecting Jewish settlements and Jewish roads, and we're talking about a very small uh, population at the time, and in collaboration with the British Army, they were supposed to you know, protect the place until the military would come and help the uh, people who are being attacked. And we have to remember 1920, 1921 were the first instances of real violent riots in the region, and that's why this organization was formed. They called it passive defense, and um, those who were more militant or activists were marginalized. There was an organization, actually private contractors, they called themselves the guardsmen, Hashomer. They were trying to um, offer their services, but they were considered to be um, too aggressive. And Sadeh was related to them through um, a joint, through joint uh, friends and um, organizational affiliation. One point nine years later, and just let me say something about the 1920-1921 events. By that point in time, Churchill was already the Minister of Colonies. And when he heard about um, the events in Palestine, he sent a special SWAT team, police SWAT team, of uh, the Black Tan and Irish um, uh, military force to um, cope with the unrest. So Churchill had this kind of exotic nature when, he, when it came uh, to military affairs, and they actually did quite well. But by 1929, things went really bad. And today, after the book by Hillel Cohen and um, the discussions about 1929, we don't, you know, there are very clear historical depictions of the level of violence that was um, um, perpetrated by mostly the British military and um, Arabs against Jews, but there were Jews who attacked the Arabs, so it was quite chaotic. But the sense within the Yishuv leadership was that we were left alone. And this, we cannot at this point judge them whether it was right or wrong. This was a very subjective feeling. And several of them could not accept Ben-Gurion's perception of defense of restraint, trying not to alienate the British forces and let them take care of our security. And they, the group in Jerusalem, uh, emerged or left the Haganah, formed Haganah Bet, that later became the Irgun, the Etzel, which is very important uh, to contextualize. At that point in time, there was an idea that Sadeh raised. And he said to Ben-Gurion, why don't we do something slightly different? The Haganah Bet said we have to attack them first. They endorsed and later became very well known for using political terrorism. Sadeh said we don't need to be so proactive, but we need to prevent or preempt attacks. We cannot wait in our settlements for the British police or the British military to arrive and save us. We need to come up with ways to outsmart them, to maybe attack known villages first, or maybe ambush them on their roads before they come 
uh, to attack us. But at that point in time, the relationship between the issue and Britain were at a point that Ben Gurion refused to even hear about it. He didn't want any opportunity for conflict or change in the British policy towards the issue that allowed immigration, etc. Sadeh became unemployed and he was quite miserable. Uh, and for many years, and we have to remember that the 1930s, the beginning of the 1930s, were a golden era for immigration from Europe. It was a terrible, the reasons were terrible, but the British policy was very lenient towards the immigrants. And then, of course, we have Palestinian nationalism that is becoming more and more forged. Mm -hmm. And they became very upset with the demogra demographic shifts in Palestine and the fact that the Jews were establishing their own communities, their own economy, their own you know, state within what they perceived was their own state. And the, as a result, in 1936, they started what, was, what is known the great, as the Great Arab Revolt. Now, here is an interesting fact. At that point in time, Britain had almost no military forces in Palestine. And the problem with the Great Arab Revolt was that the Jewish communities were mostly concentrated in urban areas. The revolt took place in the periphery. So you had different leaders, military leaders, operating in the Galilee, in the Negev, in the uh, Jerusalem area. And it was very hard to cover all this region with uh, um, limited forces. 1936 is another problem because Britain understands that Germany is probably going to cause some trouble in the future. So there, is, there are conflicts that Brita, Britain is committed to. They do not want to allocate more and more forces to Palestine just to you know, take care of this, something that could have been an anecdotal issue. And the solution that they come up with is to recruit Jews to a police force that is run by the British mandate authorities. And that these individuals are going to be armed, trained to a certain level, and then act uh, in accordance with the British instructions. The Haganah had different plans. They said, yes, absolutely, go join this police, but whatever you do, you know, listen to your commanders and then do what we tell you. And it was a very pragmatic and interesting way of looking at it. And this gave Sadeh his opportunity to form the first unit in the history of Israel, they called the mobile unit, the unit of five people, um, that was operating in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And this unit that became within a matter of weeks a role model for other uh, forces of the Haganah was very proactive. They gathered intelligence about um, uh, potential threats for their uh, settlements and they um, tried to preempt attacks by attacking first. They used night warfare, they used various types of weapons that they added to um, what the Brits gave them, and they used vehicles. This was a major change, and that's their name, the mobile unit, or Haplugano did it. Two years later, when this revolt had its ups and downs, uh, something quite fascinating happened, and this is uh, the arrival of Ord Wingate to Palestine. Ord Wingate was a very unique character. Um, a British officer, a devout Christian, I forgot the name of the denomination that he came from, but he was, um, he was mainly a, a believer of the Old Testament. And he wanted to, um, he saw what the Haganah was doing, he wanted to teach the Jews how to fight, and he wanted to do it from Kibbutz and Harod. People would ask themselves, why and Harod, why couldn't he pick a different place? And this is something that even today, rangers in the US Army are being told during their trainings. The Book of Judges describes the battle between Gideon and the Midianites. And the most important thing about it, and of course, Wingate knew it by heart. If you read, it's a fascinating episode in the Bible, 
the first, according to the Bible, the first inventor of special operations in history was the Lord himself. Because Gideon was a tough cookie. He was a judge. He didn't want to go to the battlefield. He didn't want to fight anyone. And when angels came to him and tried to convince him to do it, he sent them away. Angels are not enough. He wanted to hear from the big guy. And the Lord gave Gideon his instructions how to attack the Midianites at night. First, they did a reconnaissance operation. He selected only 300 out of 20,000 soldiers. They conducted a reconnaissance operation at night, heard the fears of the Midianites, and then the next night, they stormed into their camp with a um, fire that was concealed in jars, and they scared them away. So this was the first special operation. And of course, we had the, the stories of Troy, etc. But from a biblical perspective, Gideon is known and as the first biblical character who carried out special operations. And therefore, Wingate was a devout follower of his and called his forces, the Gideon force, in different places, in Sudan, etc. Now, Wingate was a very unique character. I'm not going to, um, to get into the story, but people were asking, how come the Haganah allowed people like Moshe Dayan, Igal Alon, the really top of the top of the, uh, the recruits, to join him? And this comes down to the pragmatism of Sadeh. He knew that Wingate could offer them training and weapons that the Haganah couldn't. So from his perspective, his ego was not the issue. The issue was how to train these individuals to fight better. And later, Wingate was there with the special night squads for a very short period of time. He was kicked out because both the Yishuv and the British forces were appalled by his tactics. He was countering the insurgencies as you know, was common at the time. He was not very... Um, particular about his tactics. And this is something that put the Haganah in a moral dilemma. I'm not sure if uh, many of you heard the term Tohar Neshek or purity of arms, but this is when it was invented. We are going to fight a war, but we are going to fight a war in the most moral way that we can. Which of course is a huge logical uh, error. And um, but ideologically they couldn't come to terms with the tactics that Wingate uh, implemented. Now, one of the most important uh, points in the history of this conflict was the Third White Paper of 1939, when Britain really changed its policies. This was the end of the Arab Revolt. Britain you know, issued very uh, uh, severe restrictions on land purchases and immigration to Palestine. And this was a very bad time to do it. It was the early summer of 1939. And Sadeh went to Ben Gurion and together they formed the first special operation force to act against Britain. They called it the special unit. It was not under the command of the Haganah. It was a clandestine force. They didn't have a lot of chance to operate, but their aim was to try and undermine the British rule in Palestine. By September, everything changed again, and Britain found itself in a predicament. And if you remember, the first stages of the Second World War were basically Britain against the world. Britain was extremely concerned that it's going to remain the last entity that is going to fight uh, the expanding um, um, German forces. And they wanted to recruit as many Jews from Palestine uh, to the uh, British forces because they needed men. They didn't want to train them for um, a combat um, uh, roles, but they wanted to recruit them uh, as diggers. This was their initial designation. Meanwhile, Sadeh believed that he needed to keep these people in Palestine because he thought, and this was quite a possibility, 
that the Nazis are going to arrive to Palestine. And as someone who grew up in Haifa, I still remember playing in the trenches that the Palmach dug on the Carmel Mountain, and they call it the Masada on the Carmel Plain, that was supposed to be the last battle over Palestine if Germany was indeed uh, to invade it. And this is a very interesting moment. It's two years before the Palmach, Plugota Machats, were officially formed by Sadeh. But Sadeh realized that here, Britain offers young men that, wants to, that want to fight the Nazis with an opportunity to go overseas and become important elements in this battle. How do you keep the best of the best behind in Palestine? And as I said, Sadeh was a very creative character. And even today, his approach is still very prevalent in the IDF. One of the things that we know about the IDF, and when you look at pictures of IDF soldiers or officers, when they stand next to American officers or British officers, you always feel a little bit embarrassed. You know, the clothes, nothing is ever, you know, no, nothing ever looks right. And it's all very, you know, all over the place. And actually, there is a system behind it. And I'm going to make a quick footnote about it so you understand the genius of Sadeh. Sadeh had no resources to offer. He couldn't even find money to buy cloth for uniform. So he needed to think about a way to make it look cool when you don't have uniform. He basically turned the sandals, the short khakis, and you know, a working shirt into a status symbol. Everyone who was wearing this uniform felt proud because he told them, you're part of the elite. And he was a very charismatic person. And he started rituals like bonfires and storytelling. And the Palmach, which was a tiny organization in military terms, was a huge cultural agent for Israel for decades to come. And this is all due to Sadez's ingenuity. One of the most interesting things about it is that when you look today at contemporary special operations forces, like many, many other armies, the paratroopers were considered for many years to be the elite of the Israeli infantry. Now there is one um, brigade of um, paratroopers who are conscripts, and they have a very particular set of uniform. You know their uh, unit tag, you know exactly where they belong to, what courses they uh, went through, etc., because of this, uh, um, this is part of their unit's pride, their esprit de corps. So there are units that wear the exact same uniform, but without all the insignia and the emblems. And when you see a soldier in Israel who has a red beret, red um, boots, looks a little bit, you know, like a soldier that you don't want in your military, you know that they are the best of the best. Because these units, and a very important person in Israel's military history who was not yet recognized is Avraham Arnan, who was one of Sadez's followers, formed a unit called Sayeret Matkal in 1957 and realized how to approach people and give them very, you know, a very self-important image with very little. So when you look at Israeli soldiers and they look very, you know, unorganized, the shoes are not shining, etc. This is the best way to look cool and to look like you are the real fighter. And I would make the equivalence to the beards and the oakleys of the Navy SEALs. You know, when you see someone wearing civilian clothes, but they have a thick beard and uh, oakleys, you know that they are part of the special operations community, and it's a status symbol. And these are very important things uh, in this context. Now, during the war, the Palmach, the unit that Sadeh uh, established, was almost inactive. They formed, you know, they were attached to uh, British forces in Palestine. They were supposed to be experts in reconnaissance, in they were supposed to lead the Australian forces, then the British forces. They were not very good. Diane, 
lost his eyes in one of the battles. And basically, the Palmach was very, I would say, mediocre at best. While Jews were fighting in Europe and acquired tons of experience in fighting conventional militaries. However, by 1942, there was a, a, again a change in the British policy. After the victory in El Alamein and the removal of the Nazi forces from uh, the Arab Arabian desert, Britain no longer worried about Palestine. And they started cracking down on these militias. They clearly didn't like the um, more radical organizations, the Lehi, the Etzel, but they forced the Palmach to dismantle. And this is again another very smart move that Sadeh did or took. Instead of dismantling the Palmach, he told Britain that he was dismantling the Palmach. But then he basically sent all his men to Kibbutzim. They were going to work in Kibbutzim, and in the afternoons they had their military trainings. And the Kibbutzim were in the periphery, so it was harder for Britain to follow and track them down. They knew that Britain had very good intelligence apparatus in the Yishuv. They had many um, spies and, and collaborators, but it was much harder for them to track them down. And this was another th important thing that today has a lot of, um, uh, generates a lot of dilemmas in Israel. This was the first time that the Haganah or the Yishuv realized that they need to produce their own weapons. So think about it, the TAS or the Israeli military industries precede the formation of the state because they were undercover producing different types of weapons that Britain refused to provide them with. And at that point, they were already getting ready for Britain to start removing its forces from Palestine so they knew that they need to build an army and they need to be well equipped. I'm not going to um, um, continue for much longer, but uh, let me make two more points about it. <coughs> the fear that special forces and to the SOE, the British crazy intelligence agency that was dismantled after the Second World War, they had a plan. If you uh, heard about the story of Hannah Senesh or the Jewish paratroopers, they wanted to inject people into their countries of origin and generate resistance or galvanize the um, uh, opposition to the German uh, occupation. And of course, to gather intelligence. These were, most of these operations were complete fiascos. But the Palmach offered Britain an opportunity. They could approach people who, who just came from Germany, just came from Hungary, just came from Yugoslavia, and recruit them. And they trained them in these small uh, uh, tactics, or small warfare tactics that were the um, trademark of the SOE. One of these units, and this is for the historians of the Middle East here, was not actually supposed to operate in Europe, but actually in the Middle East. And they were called Mistarvim. Mistarvim, and I'm almost you know, embarrassed to, to tell it you know, when Asher is here and uh, uh, other scholars who are much more familiar with me, is coming from Arabic, from Jews who were living in Arab countries and acquired the Arab language and the Arab uh, behavior. And what happened, and including in my mother's um, uh, village where she came from, there were people who spoke Arabic fluently with the right accent and they knew the Arab culture extremely well. So they could immerse themselves in Arabic communities. And mostly they were effective in gathering intelligence for the issue, for the Haganah, uh, about the plans of the Palestinian um, opposition and what was going on in the villages um, before, you know, in the 46 to 48. So this is the first time that the units like Today we have many units of uh, Mr. Vin. I don't even know how to translate it to English. Um, it's people who are under disguise, um, you know, 
looking and living like Arabs. Um, and there is a very highly recommended TV uh, series, Fauda, for anyone who, can, who um, you know, has access to Israeli TV. That, you know, it, it's fictional, but it's very interesting about what these units do. The thing is, the idea of you know, outsmarting the enemy, invading them from within, doing things that were very cost effective and very potentially uh, useful, goes back to this period. In 1945, the Palmach joined the Etzel and the Lehi and operated against Britain. And this is, I'm going to end with this story because this is something quite unique and very entertaining. The Palmach had a naval wing. They had, you know, and the naval wing was an outcome of one thing. They needed to help illegal immigrants disembark their boats and reach the shores of Tel Aviv and um, other places before the British officers would capture them. And they became very effective in sabotaging uh, the deportation ships that the British uh, military used. They used to deport those illegal immigrants to Cyprus and to other places uh, with those uh, ships. The Palmach attacked them systematically until the end of 1945. So the Palmach, in a way, became the, you know, or embodied the fear that special operations forces could become terrorist groups or at least insurgents. But the story, the, I think the best story that I've heard, and it's just for the historians, it's backed by documents, is from a guy who I interviewed last year in Haifa. He's uh, 92 years old. And he was among the um, individuals who um, sunk the most prestigious vessel in the Egyptian Navy, the Emir Farouk, at the end of the um, War of Independence. Now, the story shows you how crazy special operations can be and why Ben Gurion decided not to dismantle this unit, the Paliam's um, Divers Unit, and it was what we know today as the Naval Commandos Sheet et Shloshesre. They decided the Agana uh, sent people to Europe after the war to look for weapons. And they ended up in a shipyard in Italy. And they saw a very strange structures. You know, it looked like boats, but they were not boats. They were very uh, small. And they found a guy that worked there, or not worked there. He, he was hanging there. He was unemployed. And asked him, what was that? And he told them that these were explosive boats that the Italian naval commandos used against British ships and were highly effective until Britain came up with a counter approach and killed most of his, uh, um, he was a member of this unit, a fascist um, and anti-Semitic character who adored Hitler. But the Adana didn't give up. You know, he told them that he knew how to work with these boats. And they said, hey, you know, we can, uh, if you can teach us some tricks that can help us, you know, undermine the naval superiority of the Egyptians, why not? And they promised him that he, they are going to bring him to Palestine, he, or to Israel at that point, he's going to train people to attack British vessels, because he didn't want to attack Arabs, he wanted to attack only Brits, because he hated them. He came, this bitter Italian guy, and the, one of the guys that I interviewed was an immigrant from uh, Poland, who fought with a Palmach in a different front. And on the way back from a vacation, Yochai Binun, the head of the Palyam, caught him and asked him, do you want to do something interesting? He said, sure. So he defected from his unit and joined uh, Yochai Binun and four other guys. He had no idea about, he's never seen the um, ocean, you know, more than he was just tanning and, you know, enjoying it. Didn't know how to swim, nothing. They took them to the Kinneret, to the Sea of Galilee, with this bitter Italian guy. None of them knew how to swim, and they were supposed to learn within several weeks how to operate these explosive boats. Now, this is almost like a suicide bomber, because you need to drive the boat, and once it set, you set its course, only 100 meters prior to impact, you're allowed to um, eject. Mainly didn't succeed in, in the Second World War. These guys frustrated this Italian fascist tremendously because not only 
they didn't know how to swim. They were palmachniks. They were all followers of Sadeh. For them, a commander was a useless you know, a, a individual in a military uh, context. And they didn't want to listen to his uh, um, instructions. And eventually, he trained them to the best of his abilities. They had four units of this uh, thing. And the Navy allowed them to um, perpetrate this or to orchestrate the attack. There was one question, and this is where I'm going to finish. He was uh, telling me that there was one practical issue. Let's assume that the operation succeeds, and they manage to sink this boat. How do they know? How would anyone pull them out of the water? There are going to be many people in the water screaming, etc. The Haganah had a plan. Their military industries was working on developing infrared technologies. So they thought about attaching infrared lights to each of these operators, so once they are in the water, they could be pulled out. Now the question is, how do you attach an infrared light to a, a naval, you know, or, or a rider of an explosive boat? And the solution, I'm not sure how many of you visited Tel Aviv in the 1970s, there were these um, hats for the, you know, women used to wear hats for the beach that were not like the ones that uh, swimmers um, wear today that help them, you know, uh, with the resistance of the water, etc. They were very uh, decorative with flowers, etc. It was from rubber. So these guys from the Palmach went to Tel Aviv. It was back in the 40s. These hats be, were already um, uh, fashionable. And they bought four units and attached the infrared lights to the top of these uh, rubber hats. And they orchestrated the attack wearing these fashionable hats with flowers and an infrared light uh, beaming from the top of the head and basically sunk the most uh, formidable vehicle, uh, vessel that the Egyptian Navy had. I could go on much longer, but uh, I would like to leave time for um, uh, questions or comments. Uh, but basically, the point was that there was a very interesting interaction between the Yishuv, then Israel, and the British forces in developing um, special operations. And then, of course, it proliferated elsewhere. Thank you.